What if a fungus began infecting every living person and turned them into mindless disease spreading killers? What would you do? I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to survive the initial outbreak in The Last of Us Prologue. In 1968, two epidemiologists appear on a television interview debating what types of microorganisms could destroy mankind. One suggests that a virus such as influenza can cause massive destruction, but the other poses fungus could cause more damage in the right conditions. Fungi, he explains, have the ability not just to kill, but to control the mind of its host organism and keep the deceased alive for its needs. While not yet strong enough to be threatening to humans, as global temperatures rise, fungi might gain the ability to take over human bodies. If that happens, he says there would be no cure, and everyone would die. Okay, this is absolutely terrifying. These two scientists are debating over what's the greatest threat to mankind on national television, when this man describes something so messed up that it should have sent shockwaves across the country. Instead, everyone here goes back to their everyday lives and pretends like they haven't just heard that their brains could be taken over by a mind-controlling fungus. If it were me, I would move to an arid climate and fumigate my home to make sure it's hotter than hell. Even though these people think that they're not immediately screwed, there's something they can do to help prepare themselves for the day the fungus eventually gets sick of the swamp and decides to make their bodies its new home. Rather than pretend like none of this is ever going to happen, there should be a push for funding to create a vaccine and control this outbreak before it even happens. In 1918, the Spanish flu emerged and infected 500 million people, aka one third of the world's population, killing roughly 50 million in total. The spread of the flu was fast and deadly primarily because of the conditions of World War I and the lack of a vaccine ready and on hand. Had the people watching this news segment been more aware of history, they may have been able to see how important it was to control the outbreak before it even began. In reality, fungus isn't a threat to humans, but it's a threat to amphibians, insects, and other arthropods. More research could have been done on how the fungus takes over its amphibious hosts and how to save them before it's too late. Now, this isn't the perfect solution because amphibians are fundamentally built different than humans. So I would also push to fund research that studies less deadly fungus that can affect the human body, like candida, athlete's foot, and ringworm, to find a link between how these fungus develop and evolved to infect humans. By understanding the link in these fungi's evolution, the people in this world could have seen the warning signs coming when a more deadly fungus like the cordyceps began to do the same. Instead, they ignore the warning signs and leave themselves absolutely unprepared and are about to realize it was their biggest mistake yet. In 2003 in Austin, Texas, teenager Sarah Miller wakes up on the morning of her dad's birthday and begins to cook the two of them a special breakfast. Joel Miller comes down and the two banter about his turning 36 and their day ahead when Tommy, Joel's brother, arrives. Tommy informs Joel of unexpected complications at their construction job, forcing them to stay out late. Sarah's pissed, but Joel assures her that he will be home by 9pm with a birthday cake. Over the radio, a news broadcast mentions a troubling occurrence in Jakarta, Indonesia. The three of them rush it off, although Sarah does school them with a geography lesson. Before they head out, Sarah quickly sneaks into her father's room and finds his broken wristwatch and takes it, along with some money. Looks like he'll be paying for his own birthday gift. Outside, their neighbor Mr. Adler greets Joel, Sarah, and Tommy as they prepare to leave. He asks when Sarah will come over to visit as he feeds his elderly mother-in-law in a somewhat vegetative state, and reluctantly, Sarah agrees to visit that evening. After school, Sarah goes to a watch repair shop. As the owner begins to fix Joel's watch, his wife bursts in and kicks Sarah out, hurriedly announcing the shop's early closure. It's strange, but Sarah makes her way home in the shopkeeper's wife's warning, passing by several emergency response vehicles on the way. At her neighbor's house, Sarah and Mrs. Adler bake raisin cookies. The older woman does not seem concerned about the increased planes and emergency vehicles, even though Sarah asks about them. Eventually growing bored, Sarah browses the family's collection of movies. As she does, the elderly woman behind her begins to move erratically like she's in pain, but Sarah doesn't notice. She picks out an action movie DVD and lies that her father will be home soon so she can leave. As she exits with a container of cookies, Sarah notices the Adler's dog staring strangely at the elderly woman, but she decides to ignore it. As she walks down the street to her house, several military planes pass overhead. Later that night, Sarah is reading magazines while a news report about a series of strange and violent crimes in Austin plays on the television. When her father comes home at 10 p.m., she scolds him for being late and for getting a birthday cake before giving him his presents, the watch, and the movie borrowed from the Adlers. Okay, there are tons of warning signs here, 
Sarah is just a teenager, so we've got to cut her some slack. But there's no avoiding that the combination of everything together should have set off alarm bells much earlier. It would have been the dog staring at the old woman like this for me. I mean, there were literally cookies being baked in the room next door. What dog do you know stares at an old woman like this when they have the opportunity to catch scraps of food? Now, the earliest sign of danger was the news story covering the strange occurrence in Jakarta. The most important part of this news broadcast is that the radio host says that these are continued disturbances, which means that the disturbances have been happening for some time, and they've already been covered before. If Sarah and Joel had been paying attention to these disturbances and these occurrences in Jakarta or anything like what's about to happen, Joel, Sarah, and Tommy should have already made plans to get the heck out of a major city and isolate themselves from everyone else before shit hits the fan. The news broadcaster goes on to say how US citizens are being advised, but Joel is too busy wondering where Jakarta is to hear anything she says, if it were me. Even though he's the internet's gorgeous boyfriend at the moment, I would tell Joel to shut his beautiful mouth and turn the radio all the way up to see just exactly what's going on. The other big mistake Sarah makes here is leaving the jewelry store without asking what's going on. This woman clearly knows that there's imminent danger outside, and even though I might question her sanity, if she told me there was a brain-eating fungus running rampant throughout Austin, I still would never go outside without knowing exactly what I was going up against. Normally, it's polite to mind your own business, but when someone acts like this and then expects you to go outside, it's time to pay attention and ask questions to figure out what's got them so freaked out. If Sarah had pressed the shopkeeper's wife for information earlier, she would have known to pay more attention to the news. Without knowing more, there isn't much that she could have done here, but if it were me, once I had this knowledge, I could have found Joel and left before it was impossible to do so. I would have known to avoid other people, and I would have tried to get my hands on a computer to read real-time updates and tips from people in my area on forum boards that were available in 2003. I would also try to find a way to shield myself against the fungus, covering all exposed areas of my skin and prepare to run at a moment's notice. Instead, Joel, Sarah, and Tommy avoid the early warning signs and are about to pay the consequences. Sometime after watching the movie and Sarah falls asleep on the couch, Joel gets a call. It's Tommy, who has been put in jail for participating in a bar fight, which Tommy swears he did not start, and Joel reluctantly agrees to come and bail him out. Heading upstairs, he puts Sarah to bed and leaves. A few hours later, Sarah wakes up. It's after 2 a.m. and there are multiple aircrafts flying above the house. Something terrifying has happened and she searches for her father, but he still hasn't returned yet. When she turns on the TV, the only broadcast is an emergency message warning everyone to stay indoors. Suddenly, the Adler's dog appears at the door, begging to be let into the house, and Sarah goes outside to calm the frightened dog. When she tries to walk it back home, the dog panics and runs off. It's strange, and as car alarms go off in the neighborhood, Sarah notices the Adler's front door is open. Okay, Sarah here is still avoiding the warning signs, and Joel should have never left his teenage daughter home alone to help Tommy, leaving her all alone at her house while chaos is unfolding all around her. They should already be halfway done building a bunker somewhere out in the middle of nowhere, but instead, she's standing here with the Adler's dog, wondering what the heck is going on with all these low-flying aircrafts. Sarah needs to be woken up to the fact that there's something that's immediately going to threaten her life, and at this point, the Adler's dog is her best bet. Even though dogs can't communicate, Sarah can very clearly tell that this dog is in distress, and instead of taking it seriously, she tries to bring it back to her neighbor's house. The dog has never appeared to be in any danger before, and animals have instincts that make them able to anticipate a natural disaster before it happens. If it were me, rather than disregard the dog's behavior, Sarah should take this and her television's national alert as a sign that some sort of natural disaster is underway. Now, there's no clear scientific evidence that suggests dogs can predict natural disasters, but their olfactory senses are said to be 10,000 to 100,000 times stronger than humans, so they can smell when there's a change in the air before disaster strikes. Most fungi have a mold or mushroomy smell to them, so this dog would have been able to have smelled when the old woman was infected earlier in the day. At this point, I would assume that a tornado has struck somewhere nearby based on this dog's behavior. Austin is not particularly prone to devastating natural disasters, even tornadoes, but there have been some throughout its history. The city has even felt the shake of an earthquake in 1887, so nothing's impossible. That means that in a disaster scenario, Sarah's best bet is to listen to the national alert on her TV and stay the f indoors and shelter in place. If Sarah went back inside, there's no guarantee that the phones would be working, but she should at least try to call Joel or the police to get someone there to help her. Calling the police and getting nobody would at least shed some light on the severity of the situation, but instead, she ignores the warning signs and has come face to face with a deadly fungus to realize life as she knows it is about to change forever. 
Sarah goes up to the Adler's house to investigate, and inside, things are in disarray. She makes her way towards the kitchen, calling out to anyone, but then she slips on a pool of blood. She follows the trail and sees Mr. Adler leaning in the corner, barely alive and seemingly attacked. He's so weak, he can barely ask for help. Sarah turns towards the rest of the blood to find Mrs. Adler on the ground, being devoured by her mother. The older woman slowly looks up, and Sarah notices strange tendrils moving in her mouth. The elderly woman screams at Sarah, who begins sprinting out of the house. At that moment, her father and Tommy pull up in their truck. Both men hop out, and Joel tells Sarah to get into the vehicle. The elderly woman runs out of the house and trips on the porch. The trio stand in shock before the woman snaps back up and starts running at them again. Joel, thinking fast, uses a large wrench in his hand to bludgeon the woman down. Sarah is confused and in shock, and Joel explains to his daughter that something is happening all over town. But in order to be safe, the three of them must leave town now. They pack into the trunk and speed away from the neighborhood. On the highway, the three discuss what's going on. Tommy explains he heard on the radio that some type of virus or parasite is spreading rapidly, but no one seems to know the cause. Joel and Tommy debate if terrorists are somehow involved. Sarah asks how they can know they're infected, and Joel explains that right now, it's said to mostly be affecting people in cities. Sarah realized that the Adlers took the elderly woman into the nearby city for regular medical treatments. They drive towards a broken down van and family asking for help. Sarah and Tommy want to stop, but Joel commands them to keep going. It's cold-blooded, but it's the only way they'll be able to survive. The highway ahead becomes full of cars at a standstill, and it's clear everyone is heading out of town. With time running out, Joel tells Tommy to take a shortcut across an empty field. They do, and some other cars in the traffic jam begin to follow. Okay, Joel is finally doing the right thing. There's a deadly fungus on the loose that's making everyone go crazy, and stopping to pull over to help these people could have been a fatal mistake. Nobody likes a backseat driver, but if Tommy had pulled over and helped these people like he wanted to, they could have all been killed. When there isn't a parasite on the loose, picking up a hitchhiker is risky, and Tommy and Joel are trying to get out of town as fast as possible. Stopping to pick someone up that could have been infected would at worst kill them and at best slow them down, and they've already wasted enough time. However, there's something that Tommy and Joel could have done to have helped them escape the situation faster. Tommy here was just in jail for a bar fight with one of these infected things. Based on the state of the roads and the panicked way that Joel and Tommy show up to get Sarah, there's no doubt chaos was going down at the jail too. If they were me, while I was at the jail, I would have stolen a police radio to help me guide me away from the most infected areas. Google Maps doesn't have a setting to avoid fungus yet, so these guys are going to have to operate outside of the law. The jail wouldn't be operating regularly, making it easier to steal one, while the police try to handle these rapid insane things that have affected everyone in sight. The radio would be crucial in finding the best way to safety, as well as where to go. The men have already driven to the highway and have found it completely packed. They've had to change the course of their journey, but don't know exactly where to go next. Going anywhere near the city is a bad idea, since that's where the fungus originated, and heading back to the suburbs where they're from is bound to be worse than when they left it. Nobody is safe in this situation, not even the police, but they're better equipped to protect themselves, and by tapping into their radio, not only could Joel and Tommy find the best roads to take, they could also find a location that the police have quartered off for the infected for their own protection. They'll eventually find a place to stop, and going somewhere with people that are more equipped to defend themselves is their best bet. There's possibly even military involvement at this point, and there could be efforts to fly them out of there. With a little more thinking on their feet, these guys could have maximized their potential for escape, but how can you blame them when the infected look like this? Your fight or flight response must be going crazy. After passing over a hill, they spot a huge convoy of army vehicles on the highway they need to get on. In a panic, Tommy takes the truck in a different direction, the only way they can go. Joel and Tommy devise a plan to take the outskirts as far as they can, then head towards Mexico. Terrified, Sarah suggests the infection could be worldwide, but the men don't answer, determined to survive. Suddenly, three passenger planes appear, flying dangerously low. A fleet of emergency vehicles cuts off the truck's path and forces them to drive through the center of town. In town, there's pandemonium. People are running, fighting, and looting. It's a difficult street to navigate. A large swarm of people exit a movie theater and force Tommy to drive backwards. That's when Sarah notices something in the sky and realizes it's a plane falling towards the town. She yells a warning to them and Tommy throws the truck back into drive as the plane crashes, creating a massive explosion. Debris begins flying everywhere and shoots into the truck, knocking Sarah unconscious. The girl wakes up as her father tries to pull her out of the truck. After they do, another car crashes into theirs, setting on a fire and separating Sarah and Joel from Tommy. Since it's too dangerous to get around, the brother tells Joel to meet at the river outside of town. 
With no other options, Joel carries Sarah, who hurt her ankle in the crash and can't run. Moving through the alley, Joel comes upon a horde of the infected, busily devouring people. He tries to be quiet, but one of them notices and begins pursuing them. It chases the survivors through a restaurant, barreling after them as he nearly avoided catching up to them. Running out of the building, it's about to reach the survivors outside of the restaurant, but is shot in the head. Joel turns and sees the soldier who rescued them. He tries to explain that his daughter is injured, but the soldier orders him to stand still as he radios his commander. Sarah worries about meeting with Tommy again as the officer gets a command back over the radio, but then the man aims his gun at them, intending to kill them. Okay, initially Joel was right to trust this military guy. In natural disaster situations or when there's a threat to civilians, the military is supposed to help people fleeing from the threat and Joel was just saved by this soldier. So it makes sense that he thinks he's no longer in danger. The soldier is supposed to help him get to safety, but there were subtle signs Joel could have looked for to realize this was not going to happen at all. The soldier tells Joel and Sarah to stay put and uses his radio to call his higher ups about what he should do with them. His whole tone changes and he asks him to repeat the command. According to research done on communication at UCLA, only 7% of communication is the actual words being said, 38% of it is the way a person says it, and 55% of communication is based on body gestures and language. Which means that I'm 38% positive that Joel here is screwed because the way the soldier asks his commanding officer to clarify indicates he's disturbed by what the officer has just told him to do. The soldier is also holding a gun pointed at the two of them. So based on the situation, I'm also 55% sure this guy's having the worst day on the job of his life. And at this point, protecting himself is priority number one. The combination of his tone of voice and the gun pointed at Joel should indicate that it's time to run. The biggest problem here is that Joel doesn't have anywhere to go or anything to hide behind. If he runs, the soldier could shoot him from a distance and he has a long way to go before he's able to get to cover. His best bet is to drop Sierra and run at the soldier since he's closer to him and hoping that the element of surprise works in his favor. However, Joel doesn't do this and has to suffer one of the worst losses imaginable to realize fungus isn't the only thing that can hurt you in this world. Realizing what's happening, Joel begins to run but is shot by the soldier. He falls down a slope and drops Sarah who rolls away. The soldier stands over Joel preparing to execute him when he's shot dead by Tommy at the last second. Joel immediately runs towards his daughter who has been critically injured. She's bleeding out from a wound in her abdomen. Joel yells at his brother to help, but Tommy doesn't. He stands there as the situation sinks in. In denial, Joel applies pressure to Sarah's wound and attempts to pick her up as she screams in pain. Slowly, Joel understands that he can't stop the bleeding, and his daughter dies in his arms. It's tragic, but soon he'll be going to a galaxy far, far away to get a replacement. But what do you think? How would you beat The Last of Us prologue? Let me know with a comment down below. Thank you so much for watching, leave a like and subscribe, and check out the How To Be playlist for more videos like this. Until next time, have a damn good day.